present we're going to examine uh, a remarkable work written in the early Enlightenment by John Battista Vico called The New Science. It's an excellent example of one of the historiographical and philosophical uh, projects of the early Enlightenment with respect to history. And I want to talk first of, uh, briefly about some of the characteristics of the early Enlightenment. Uh, what I mean by the early Enlightenment is the period before about 1750. The early Enlightenment was characterized by a commitment to what we might call a naturalistic metaphysic. A metaphysic of also known as uh, mechanistic materialism. This metaphysic or view of reality was largely based on the successes of Newtonian science in the preceding uh, decades. It looked to science as the means to all rational and possible knowledge. There was a great sense of breakthrough with uh, Newton's laws of gravitation, with uh, realization about how the heart worked, how the circulatory system worked. There was a sense that with a little bit of effort, all of nature could be subsumed under the sort of mathematical laws uh, and, uh, and analyzed through the experimental method that Newton had axiomatized in his Principia. The uh, impetus of this sort of scientific revolution very quickly in the early Enlightenment was moved towards the human sciences. There was a very strong urge to take the success Newton had made in understanding nature using the same techniques, the same method, the same approach, and to apply it to understanding humanity itself. And the uh, phrase that was commonly heard at the time was the science of man, a scientific understanding of humanity. Now, this is naturalistic and mechanistic or materialistic in the sense that it attempts to explain the nature of man without recourse to any sort of principles that one would not find in explanation of natural phenomena. So there's an attempt to avoid uh, what might be called entelechy or teleology, the view that there are internal end states which are natural to certain sorts of development, that things naturally tend towards a certain sort of conclusion. And instead, to replace that, that old Aristotelian legacy with the Newtonian conception of law, of regularity, of constant conjuncture and conjunction of certain phenomena which always lead to the same results. Now, the science of man uh, took two forms. One was a, what we might call scientific psychology, an attempt to um, categorize, produce a taxonomy for, and a model uh, that explained all of the, quote, laws of human behavior, the laws of the operation of the human mind. And uh, perhaps the most famous uh, philosopher in that regard was David Hume, whose treatises and inquiries were all attempts to exhibit the fundamental structure of our cognitive uh, capacities and the laws with which and by which we reproduce our thoughts um, and our beliefs. And it, previously, Spinoza had attempted to uh, do the same thing for our emotional states again producing a deductive, axiomatic, rigorous scientific method that w after positing a few fundamental drives and entities was able to deduce all of the other emotional states which uh, characterize uh, human nature or human character. Well that was one sort of approach. The other sort of approach was to understand the science of man through a study of the laws of historical causation which is to say, to look for the regularities, the constant causal forces that produce change over time in societies, between societies, uh, among nations. And again, the goal was to omit things like principles, teleoses, end states, natural sort of final ends towards which a thing evolves, and, and replace that with mechanisms that could explain changes. Now, the Enlightenment has often been criticized 
as anti-historical in its uh, orientation, precisely because it conceived of human nature as fixed and as static, as eternal. And as we'll see, one of the developments of historicism is the view that that is in fact not the case, that human nature is malleable and constantly is changing, growing, and developing with um, each epoch, each changing set of historical circumstances and cultural inputs. I want to argue that that's not, while there's some truth to that criticism, it's not entirely fair. There is an extent to which, uh, even with mechanism, and even with positing certain fundamental proclivities, there was still room for development, for historical change and growth within the early Enlightenment's conception of history. Well, I've mentioned the two approaches to the science of man. What's remarkable about Jean Battista Vico is that he combines both in his new science. Vico was a professor of rhetoric at Naples um, who argued that history develops along lines which replicate the patterns of human cognitive development or mental psychological development, and that these follow certain discrete patterns each of which uh, gives rise to the next in an ex uh, almost exclusively mechanistic fashion. So we have with Vico a developmental model, one which does have a sense of change, of uniqueness, and of difference, and yet at the same time um, searches for law and regularity, for a scientific explanation of historical changes. Vico's work in his own lifetime was relatively obscure. He was known, uh, but not widely, and he was not widely heralded either. Um, that changed the 19th century with the development of historicism, particularly among German philosophers. Vico was finally rediscovered as the great asset that he, in fact, was, as the great scholar and theorist about history, in many ways thought to be a precursor to Hegel, Herder, and other influential thinkers of the 19th century. His work has also had a profound impact on uh, some 20th century literature and even philosophy. Most famously, of course, uh, the writing of James Joyce, whose Finnegan's Wake is, in fact, a uh, mythopoetic Viconian history, with a corso di corso, as Vico would say. Um, we begin our discussion with the epistemological status of history. Vico was, as I've mentioned, an Italian and was part of the rationalist tradition in European philosophy. The rationalist tradition had been dominated by its great founder, René Descartes, whose epistemology, based on clear and distinct ideas, which is to say that the mark of truth of any of our beliefs, of any of our conceptions, our notions, our concepts, is the extent to which it's, uh, it can be apprehended by the mind with absolute clarity and distinction. And his model here was, of course, geometry and mathematics, where one has completely formal definitions of all of the entities, triangles being two-dimensional, three-sided, enclosed objects. Every triangle is that. Only triangles are that. Every triangle has 180 degrees. Only triangles have 180 degrees. And that was his model for uh, rational thought, for science, which, as we know, exhibits, uh, uh, is exhibited in mathematical laws, um, and, in fact, for even philosophy. This, of course, uh, raised a major problem for history. Unlike mathematics and geometry, its objects are not clear and distinct. They are, in fact, uh, things that arise from experience. They're much more ambiguous. We don't define a state. We gesture at a state. If someone asks you, what's a politician, you usually don't come up with a definition unless you're a comedian. Instead, you point. You, you give examples. You say, well, George Bush was a politician. Bill Clinton's a politician, etc., etc., etc. At the same time, history is not uh, liable to experimentation. One can't say, let's see if, it, in fact, it wasn't uh, the calling of the estate general that, called the, that caused the French Revolution. Let's start it all over again and not call the estate general. That's not a possibility for historical understanding. Therefore, the Cartesian epistemology really precluded the possibility of history being anything more than anecdotal. It was not 
uh, a domain of scientific understanding, and because it did not produce clear and distinct concepts, um, it could not be a science. Well, Vico critiques this argument, beginning with uh, the principle which, underla which underlay it, which was Descartes' cogito ergo sum. Descartes sought first for one unquestionable principle from which he could deduce the rest of his philosophy, and that was, of course, that I think, therefore I am, an undeniable proposition. And he used that to support and build up his epistemological doctrine. Vico's argument is that, in fact, the cogito isn't, and, and, and the, the certainty of the cogito, the certainty that because you're thinking you must exist, is in fact intuitive. And not only intuitive, it's unreflective. It's not something that requires inference. It's not something that requires reflection, contemplation. It's something much more on the order of self-awareness. And Vico would say that that's extremely similar to the awareness that I have a pain in my stomach or I had a headache last night. Not to say that it's not knowledge, but it's clearly sub-scientific. Moreover, the clarity and distinction uh, criteria of truth, Vico argued, only applies to mathematics. And it only applies to mathematics because the objects of mathematics are conceptual innovations. And this was an important uh, breakthrough on Vico's part. He argues that, uh, in line with the nominalists, there are really no triangles. There are really no numbers. One never comes in contact with a one. One never stubs his toe on a pentagon. Instead, what they are are fictions. They're conceptual innovations built up from axiomatic schemes. And the reason we can have clarity and distinction about them is because we created them axiomatically. So it's built in by the fact that we created them. And we created them with that sort of precision because we wanted to do precise work with them. Similarly, physical entities, the sorts of things that are subject to scientific understanding, are based on experience. And we don't have clarity and distinction for our uh, scientific entities. Right? There is no clear and distinct notion of, of matter, of force. We can characterize it in terms of its relation to other things, F equals MA, et cetera, et cetera. But the way we come to understand that is not through deduction, but through experiment through experience. And ex the experimental method gives us a practical certainty, not an absolute certainty, about the nature of the physical world. In fact, it gives us incomplete knowledge, which is evidenced by the historical growth of scientific understanding. Newton is supplanted by Einstein. Um, and we can think of uh, examples in other fields as well of one scholar's work, which is valid for its time being uh, subsumed under the work of the later, greater innovator. So what Vico argues then is that the cogito and the epistemology that grows from it needs to be replaced by a principle that he suggests, which is called virum factum. We know what we have made. The reason we know the truth about mathematics in a clear and distinct way is because we've made those scientific entities. We invented them. We posited them and we formulated them. Even in our science, our experiments turn to be a sort of making, an incomplete making, but nonetheless a making that gives us an incomplete practical certainty. History is obviously made exclusively by humanity. Therefore, since it is cognitively constructed by man, it can be understood by man with scientific certainty. And I want to stress what he means by making something. When we make a concept in physics, what he means to say is, we take a range of phenomena and cognitively construct that into an entity. And because we've cognitively constructed it in a precise way to accord with our experimental results, we have, in a sense, mentally made it as an object. We've demarcated a range of the phenomena of experiences we've had, parsed them into a certain bit, and called that a particular thing. Well, the upshot of all this is that Vico, in his own mind at least, established that history can be a science and that history can be known with scientific certainty. I want to turn to the course of history as Vico envisioned it. Vico held to a, a cyclical theory of history, um, which nonetheless is not to be confused with eternal return. Vico believed that there were certain patterns that recurred over and over 
in historical development. But that as, the, as a nation moved from one phase to another and throughout an entire cycle and then started again, there was nonetheless development between cycles. So each cycle is in its own way unique, different, has its own particular peculiar characteristics. These cycles that I've mentioned are a common course of development that, ne that Vico felt one could find in every nation, civilization, and culture. And in fact, he argued that all civilizations, nations, and cultures go through three distinct stages. Each stage represents a distinct uh, realization of the potentialities of human nature. In other words, each stage represents a distinct level of cultural activity, of uh, consciousness, and of what we might call mentality. He also argues that the mentality and institutions that typify a particular stage are preserved among the new institutions and mentalities that develop in later stages. So in a sense, nothing is lost in history. The elements of the older mentality are still preserved. And we saw this as well in Iliad. Cyclical conceptions that date from our prehistory still uh, have a place within our modern linear uh, historical experience. Now, what moves history through the cycles, which I'll get into in a couple minutes, or the stages, is a mechanism, a precise mechanism. And that mechanism is class struggle. And in this way, Vico is an incredible precursor to Marx and Marxism. For he sees in the development of a society and nation greater social differentiation among the members of that society in terms of stratification of classes, of groups, and of castes. And he sees the natural tendency is for these castes and classes to struggle against each other for power, for privileges, for comforts. As they struggle, they move history from one stage to another. Each stage becomes increasingly popular, humanistic, democratic. When the cycle has finally run its course, and we've run through the ultimate expression of human equality and uh, rationality, human dignity, the civilization in, undergo in question, or the culture or nation, undergoes dissolution. It falls apart through one of two mechanisms, either through internal disintegration or through external conquest. When that happens, the entire process begins anew. And we start again from the first cycle. Now, the scope of Vico's theory, which is to say the domain of historical phenomena he wants to account for, is the profane history of the post-Diluvian Gentiles. Post-Diluvian means after the flood, Noah's flood. Um, we can't say for certainty whether it was due to extreme piety or to prudence, uh, whether Vico, uh, what pro which prompted Vico, but nonetheless, he did choose to exclude from his theory the history of the ancient Hebrews and the history of, um, uh, of Christ. And his analysis begins only and includes only those nations which were not Hebraic and which followed, uh, supposedly, the flood from Noah. In fact, he argues that briefly after the, uh, the flood, there are several hundred years of a return to uh, vicious barbarism as the descendants of Noah that don't become the Hebrews wander through the forests, lose, control, lose the ability to speak, uh, and lose any civilization that they had before. For us, that means that we are going to treat this uh, bracketing that uh, either prudential or pietistic exclusion of the Hebrews by arguing that, looking at Vico as arguing from the beginning of the emergence of primitive man. Since the post-Diluvian flood for him represents what we would consider primitive man. The primary focus of the study, the paradigm case with which he's going to work, is Hellenical classic Greece and Rome. Now, this is in part because of the wealth of its sources, uh, particularly for an Italian in Naples. There's no uh, lack of legal documents, philosophic documents, literary documents that one could find 
uh, from the uh, Roman Republic and Empire. Um, but it's also in part due to the classical Hellenic, Hellenic world's obvious affiliation with the culture of Western Europe. And our, obviously that's uh, the ancestor culture or civilization from which Vico feels we have developed. Its history, that of Rome and classical Greece, is held to be typical in the sense of an archetype. It is the pattern of development which would occur everywhere if not for external influences. And the external influences can be the intrusion of God's providence or the intrusion of one civilization upon another, arresting and changing it in some way. The means Vico uses are what I would call an empathic understanding, it's the sort of empathic understanding one finds in anthropology, a thinking of one's position into the position of that of the historical actor of the time, trying to sort of get inside their psychological or cognitive shoes. The other technique he uses, and here is a, here is a precursor to um, Nietzsche, is philological research, to study the structure and history of language, the development of words, Vico felt enabled one to understand the development of mentalities, of mind frames, and of cultures. Okay, now I wish to turn to the uh, various stages. There are three, the first of which he calls the Age of Gods. Primitive man, in Vico's sense, is a beastly creature. His consciousness is extremely limited. He's barely outside of the animal state. His fundamental proclivities are instinctual, aggressive, predatory. He's crude and violent. And Vico characterizes these figures as giants in accord with uh, scriptural accounts, but also in, in accord with um, the Homeric accounts in which Ulysses visits the Cyclops. And he argues that the Cyclops is a paradigm of primitive man, first man, the man who is giant in the sense of being intellectually dwarfed. The first breakthrough to history proper from prehistory is the establishment of the family state. The family, he considers, the first fundamental institution of the age of the gods. And his argument runs something like this. Primitive men lived in jungles and forests, wandered wildly, had sex whenever the uh, desire prompted him, had no close fellows, no lifelong mates. At some point, thunder and lightning in the sky produced incredible fear on the part of some of these primitive peoples. And it prompted them to take shelter in the caves. And when they took shelter in the caves, they chose particular women who they dragged off with them. Those were the first marriages. Now, part of what prompts Vico to make this interpretation is his exploration of uh, Paleolithic caves in Europe. And he obviously recognized that the first people lived in such caves and their art represents their primitive, uh, imagistic consciousness. Now these first primitive men living in caves believe in storm gods, gods of thunder. Now we're acquainted with many of them, Zeus, Jove, Marduk, Indra, um, Thor, Donner, or all, and every culture has one, is particularly uh, early primitive cultures, in which these are jealous, wrathful, sky warrior deities who hurl thunderbolts like spears. And their thunderbolt is a message and a command, right? They hurl the thunderbolt when something bad has been done to send a message to prompt a behavior. And so the principal form of wisdom of this age, the age of the gods, is augury, right? If you want to know what it is that the gods demand of us, capture a dove, cut it open, read its liver. Its liver will tell you, the disposition of its internal organs will tell you, because the dove comes from the sky, the land of the sky god, what exactly the god demands. And in fact, we find that augury is actually a prevalent practice among many primitive cultures and well into uh, late Roman times. The ruler of this primitive family state is obviously the father, the patriarch. He is the king, the judge, and the priest, the reader of the auguries. And he has absolute and complete power. 
And here we can think of the story of uh, Abraham with his son Isaac, taking his son off to sacrifice him to the God because he's received an augury, a message from the gods, kill your son. What strikes us often is uh, about that is how could a man have killed his own son? But given this primitive mentality, it's pretty straightforward. The gods demand it, you do what the gods say, otherwise the thunderbolt gets you. What's more remarkable and really supports Vico's theory is why would the son go alone? The principle being the father had the right to take any life within the family state that he chose. He was the representative of all authority, divine and secular. Now, the principal institutional supports of this stage are three. First, religion. The interpretation of the divine message, of divine providence, the notion that all of our patterns and laws come from above. And we saw this very much in, in Iliad's uh, analysis, that there is a sense of archetypal message from above. The second is the burial of the dead, because this has to do with the notion of immortality, that somehow the soul lives on, and if correctly buried, will uh, return, live again. And this burial of the dead establishes that somehow the human body and the human is different from all other animals, which after eaten can be left out, the corpse, to rot. Somehow humans are different. So primitive man is beginning to get a sense of his humanity, of his difference from nature. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, marriage. The creation of stable family relations in which fathers know who their children are. Marriages which then can settle terms of inheritance. The patriarch through marriage produces patrimony, inheritance. Um, all of these institutions push us out of the animal state. Vico, however, uh, notes that a lot of theorists had argued for such a primitive early age of man and generally called it the golden age, the age when man spoke to God. Vico will have none of that. This popular mentality was crude, and what little, what little order existed um, was due to frightful religions, religions of absolute severity, where not only Abraham sac sacrifices Isaac, but um, Agamemnon sacrifices his daughter uh, Briseis to the winds so that he can get a good passage to Troy, to sack Troy. And there's no question raised about it. his wife isn't particularly happy, but none of the fellow warriors bat an eyebrow. It's the natural thing to do. If you don't get the wind, sacrifice your daughter, the wind's happy. Um, the other thing supporting this epoch is brutal severity. So this is certainly not a golden age, and the mentality of this epoch is crudely physical at best, and it's based on sense. Um, nature is thought to contain signs about what we ought to do and what the laws are. And the heavens and all things are divine auspices. We walk off on a path and stub our toe. The gods put us there. This is not the right path to take. And the, the obedience of the patriarch and the family state, however, does lead to something important. That obedience prepares people for the next important stage, the breakthrough to the city-state. And that is, of course, the age of heroes. Now, this goes through two, pro two sort of transitional stages. First, some of the primitive men who wander in the forests, rather than getting religion and heading to the caves, seek refuge from their fellows. There's a, wall, a war of all against all in those forests among primitive men. And the weaker ones, rather than be killed by the stronger, go to the people who lived in the caves and now have left the caves and seek uh, protection in what are called, in these huge clearings in the forest, that are called asylums. And in fact, the beginning of Rome, he argues, was just one such asylum. The land was cleared so that we could get a clearer view of the sky and read the divine auspices. The second step is that the patriarchs, the fathers, kill off the violent marauders, and the refugees become their clients. And the word for client, philologically, Vico figured out in Latin, is actually famuli, the root of our word family. It's not a genetic tie. It's not a biological tie. It's a tie of protection, of clientage. Now, these clearings, these asylums, very quickly become villages, where the patriarch is still the king, the priest, and the father of his family, or his tribe, or his clan. And we might find such a, a, a structure among uh, Native American peoples at the moment of contact. Um, the refugees are put to work on the land, which is obviously owned exclusively by the patriarchs or fathers. 
They are denied any sacred marriages so that their children are always bastards. And because they have no sacred marriages, and marriages must be done sacredly according to the divine rights, they have no patrimony, no property that can be inherited. After the land is settled, obviously this new group of refugees rebel after a certain amount of time. They realize they're getting a rather raw deal, and the result is they're given the agrarian law, the first agrarian law, which Vico found in classical Greece as well as in uh, pre-classical Greece as well as in pre-classical Rome. And this agrarian law essentially gives them the status of serfs or peasants. They're given a right to, to control, to live on the land where they, that they cultivate, a right, to, a right to pass it on to their children, as long as those children continue to submit and give proceeds to the uh, parents, to the fathers, to the patriarch. This social order is obviously feudal. This is a feudal social uh, structure in which essentially the basic relationship between patriarch and client is that of vassalage, a bond of fealty uh, and protection. Now, what happens is that the heroic fathers, the patriarchs, unite. And they unite against the refugees uh, on, a, on the basis of their sort of class consciousness and class interests. And they create heroic or aristocratic commonwealths, which are found in pre-Republican Rome and uh, Homeric Greece and which are the exclusive domain of the patriarchs, who are both magistrates and priests. These patriarchs are now considered heroes, and heroes means sons of the gods. Uh, and their order is Hercules. The myth had it that Hercules founded every city in Greece. And he says we have to read that not as a fictional account, nor as an authoritative history, but as a mythic history. What it expresses is the fact that Hercules etymologically means um, son of the gods. And what it basically means is that the sons of the gods, the patriarchs, founded all of the cities. The human nature of this heroic age is proud and magnanimous, very much like uh, the character of Achilles in uh, the Iliad, or for that matter, of a chivalric knight. The law is based on exactly worded agreements, on contracts where the word must be carried out with all its specificity. There is no sense of compassion here. And the rule is obviously severe. The goal of this entire structure is comfort on the part of both the patriarchs, who wish to extract as much as possible from their serfs and monopolize power, and the clients who are now becoming plebes or plebeians. The mentality of this epic is characterized by imagination by poetic creativity, at least at the outset. And this is reflected in the fantastic barbarian warrior epics produced, like the Iliad uh, in the subcontinent of Asia, the Mahabharata. Um, and as we'll see uh, later on in Europe, the uh, Songs of Roland and the other great chivalric epics. Towards the end of this stage, however, that creativity, that poetic insight, that ability to read things in analogical terms exclusively begins to give way to a practical rationality, to a much more law-like understanding of the world. This emergence of the city-state represents the rise of a nation or civilization. Then we get to the third age, the final age, the age of men. Slowly but surely, the plebeians continue to fight for their rights. This fight goes through three stages. In the first stage, they get the right to solemnize marriages. For the first time, they are able to have legitimate family structures which are legally recognized and therefore allow them to transmit property to their uh, children. In the second stage, they get the right to citizenship. They get the right to citizenship because initially they are forced to be the soldiers the foot soldiers for the heroic warriors. And this is his interpretation of statements like Achilles fought against, on his own against the great forces of uh, the Trojans. What that really means, he said, is that Achilles was the only hero fighting. He had his 10,000 serfs with him, of course. I mean, no man fights against 10,000 single-handedly, but he was the only real hero, the only real man, the only person whose name deserves to be mentioned. But since these um, military uh, efforts have such important value, and once you're armed, it's hard to be disarmed, eventually they seize the right to become citizens. 
to be protected by the laws of the regime. And finally, the last part is the right to hold office in the state. And at that moment, we have seen a fundamental breakthrough in human equality. This age as a whole, the age of men, and it's considered the age of men because it recognizes the human equality of all men in light of their shared rationality. In it, for the first time, old traditional laws, which were based on exactly worded agreements, are now reinterpreted universally as natural laws, of laws of reason. High cultural institutions emerge for the first time, academies, as in Athens and Greece. Philosophy reaches its apogee, its high point. And this process culminates in the rise of democratic republics and is facilitated by the development of various character types among the rulers. And I want to briefly run through these. The first of these is the valorous and just nature of uh, leaders like Scipio Africanus or Pericles in Greece who open the way for popular liberty, who fight for the rights of the common soldier. And this represents the development of the nation. We've had the rise with the city-state, now we get the development. And the nature of this development is benign. It's a certain amount of compassion for all humans in the society. Such liberty, however, and, its demo and such democracy is always, according to Vico, inherently unstable and always leads to internal divisions and civil war because the class differentiation doesn't end. And now the different classes all are politically empowered. The stakes have risen and the result is always civil war. The example in Greece would be the Peloponnesian War. The example in Rome would, of course, be the horrible civil wars, which uh, destroyed almost Rome um, after the Punic Wars. And now this leads to the second type of, of leader that moves the, uh, the development along, and that's the ambitious leader. Uh, great figures like Alexander the, uh, the Great or Julius Caesar, who restore order to the nation by bringing it back in the form of a monarchy. But monarchies with civil rights. And this is the maturity of the culture. So these monarchies, although they are despotic rules, at the same time, they are rules of law. So they are, in some sense, republican. It's after this point that things start to go downhill. The monarchies are firmly established by reflective, melancholy, and sensitive types, like Tiberius. These types represent the growing delicacy of the culture's nature. It's become over-refined. It's become a bit soft. It's lost its vigor. And finally, <coughs> the culture and, and state is destroyed with the next sort of ruler, those who've gone from delicacy and refinement, a bit of a fetness, to complete dissolution and decadence, madmen like Caligula and Nero. The overall mentality of this period is characterized by reason. But eventually, this reason, which starts out as a practical rationality, becomes purely skeptical and critical. It comes to the point where it begins to critique everything around it as irrational and undermines the possibility of all knowledge, argues that everything is fundamentally relative. And it's a question of what you like and what you want to do. So philosophy and skeptical reason, then, come to replace the sociocultural glue that is religion. The sacred, which binds us together in a common project, is displaced in favor of uh, a barren intellectualism. The poetic wisdom and creativity of the age of heroes gives over to a dry, critical, redactive analysis. Similarly, legal and social humanism are accompanied by growing decadence in the form of, uh, as the laws become more humane, people cease to think about the public good and are only concerned about their private advantage and their private concerns. Ultimately, the society disintegrates, or it is overrun from without, ushering in a new barbarism. I want to turn in the few remaining minutes I have to the recourse of institutions in the second barbarism. Vico finds this pattern that I just mentioned among the ancient Greek civilization. He finds it among the Romans. An argument could be made that it could be found among other cultures as well. But he wants to argue that the cycle then repeats itself. And his example is, again, Europe. Once a culture, a nation, a people, has run its course, the corso, 
It continues to de degenerate until it can recover the religious and primal spontaneity of the primitive mind. That fundamental sort of tapping into the well of, of creativity and of, uh, of sort of psycho-spiritual elan. And this contact with the primal spontaneity of the primitive mind always is expressed as contact with God or divine providence. Once that occurs, and we continue to degenerate until that occurs, and it may take the form of, say, a religious revival or an awakening, the process can begin all over again. We start from the first stage. So take the example of Rome. Rome disintegrated from within. Internal war, disaffection, self-interest, greed on the part of its provincials led to a breakdown of civic spirit, uh, an unwillingness of people to join the Roman army, the recruiting of German barbarians, which ultimately re re uh, resulted in their being overrun by German barbarians. When that happened, a new barbarism swept Europe, right? A dark age. It could only emerge from that and begin its ascend through this institutional development once again once it had reemerged into an age of gods. And that is exactly what the early Christian church represents for Vico. The early Christian church heralded a new age of the gods, where again we found um, auguries in the signs of the heavens, the coming of the kingdom of Christ, and also in other sorts of auguries, the cult of relics, the prophecies of Joachim of Flores, etc., etc., etc. There's a return to the sort of primitive, basic uh, mentality of fear and trembling before uh, God. The next stage, the Age of Heroes, is represented in medieval Europe. Medieval Europe was a feudal society, a society of clients, where, and if we think about what the clients or peasants were, they were individuals who needed protection from warlords. In, fa in, fact, in fact, in part, from the warlords who protected them. And again, we find that the figure of the heroic aristocrat, who is now the knight, fulfills the same role that the Homeric hero fulfilled for uh, Homeric Greece. And the only distinction between them and those who preceded them is that of being Christian. And in fact, again, if we think of the great epics, uh, which are written during the second uh, heroic age, epics always being written during heroic ages, um, again, they mention one particular knight fighting a huge battle. And Vico says, and we know historically it's the same phenomenon. That knight's not the only one on the field. There's another hundred people with him. The other hundred people are foot soldiers. They're not real people. They're not sons of the gods. They don't get represented in history books. This is not a period of human equality. Finally, there is the rise of absolutism and the age of reason in the 17th century. And this, for Vico, announces the next age of man, which is what we are presently in. It is, again, we turn from traditional feudal laws, canon laws, and expand them into natural laws based on right reason. We stress the fundamental equality of man. We see the emergence, which he prophesies quite correctly, of democratic republics in the next 50 years after his writing in 1744. And, of course, we can expect that it will run its same course. Now, I want to conclude with the implications of Vico's theory. Each of these stages, as I've mentioned, represents a different level of development of human mentality. A primitive stage in the age of gods, a poetic stage in the age of heroes, and a rational stage in the age of men. Each stage gives rise to its successor. Now, this can seem pessimistic, this scheme, in that there really is no way of breaking the cycle. The course must run its course, and then its recourse over and over again. On the other hand, as an historian, or as people concerned about history, it had a dramatic implications. It means that an artifact like Homer's Iliad or heraldic paraphernalia, shields of arms, are no longer just antiquarian things or poems or ridiculously mythic histories. They're, in fact, sources through which you can reconstruct a distinct previous mentality. We look at heraldic arms, arms as something from which we can interpret the field being the field of grain, the gold being the gold of grain, 
and the arms representing the lineage of the solemnized marriage of the heroic knight. And this means that we use his historical artifacts not as authorities, but as documents, as an insight to interpreting past events. Another co consequence of this doctrine is that, for us politically, the state and other institutions have to be based, if we're going to be wise, on the character and cultural development of a nation, not on a utopian scheme. Not all people can, at present, have a democracy. If a culture is going through the age of heroes, imposing a democracy on it will lead to that democracy being overthrown quite shortly. So every nation develops according to its own patterns, and there is no utopian scheming. The best way to plan or structure a government is to be aware of the level of development of the culture and nation and people, and from that, uh, apply the correct government scheme. On a broader plane, for Vico, history teaches us the psychological nature of man. It teaches us who we are, and it is, the, in fact, the true science of man. In it, we see man in three different aspects a sensual, quasi-brutish creature in the age of gods, a creative and imaginative, daring figure in the age of heroes, and then finally, as a rational, fully humane animal in the age of men. This means we've gained an understanding by looking at history of what we are and what we have been and what we can be. Thank you very much.